We ought to be grateful. We ought to be grateful. That is for everything that God has done for us, everything that God is going to do for us. We ought to be grateful even before it lands in our possession. We ought to be grateful. There is one thing that I forgot to mention. Uh, let us pause and give thanks to God for these ladies this morning. I know we just had three up there, amen, but let's thank God for them, our musicians. Amen. And we, we did not mention about the sermon outline and overview. I do want to make sure you know that that's posted on, online on the website. We are starting a new sermon series, uh, Giving and Receiving Loves. Work, um, this is something that we worked out. Uh, based on what was given to us by the welcome team. And the sermon series is just simply give and receive love. So there'll be four messages uh, this month dealing with uh, giving and receiving love. And the first one is coming from the gospel quoted by John chapter 13 in a very familiar uh, passage of scripture, two verses. John chapter 13 and verse 34 and 35 and when you found that please say amen if you're in the virtual world i just have to take it for granted uh, that you found it but if you're in-house when you get to john 13 34 35 please say amen and today we want to talk about uh, giving others radical love Radical love. Let's peep into uh, John chapter 13, verse 34, 35. Verse 34, reading from the New American Standard Version. Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I love you, that you also love one another. Jesus says, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples. Watch the condition. If you have love for one another. Let's pray. Oh, why is an eternal God? Thank you for how you blessed us in preparation, for how you blessed us in the reading of your word, the studying and interpretation of your word. We need you now, dear God, to move and continue to move in presentation of your word, that we might share this word with the people of God and all who are gathered here on today and those who are listening virtually. God bless us on today to hear this word in the way that you want it to be heard and live it in the way that you want us to live it. It sounds so easy just to love others. But if it was so easy, dear God, then we would not find it so difficult on the occasions when we do. Help us to press our way through those difficult moments and love the way Christ is commanding us to love. It's in Christ Jesus' name we do pray these words. Amen. Giving others radical love. Giving others radical love is not, it's not selfish. Giving others radical love is, is selfless. Let's see how this plays out in the message. When Ola Mae Turner met Shirley Nance, her perspective about life changed. Before Ola Mae met Shirley Nance, she had lived in the same town around 40 years. Everyone who knew Ola Mae Turner 
wanted nothing to do with her. Even though she was a lifelong member of St. Peter's Missionary Baptist Church, when church members would see her coming, they go the other way. The people on her job treated her the same way. And one of the reasons why people tried to avoid Ola May is because she was a busy body, a gossiper. Even though she didn't get out much, she knew everybody's business. If you brought up someone's name, Ola May knew something about that person. And she had some juicy gossip to share about that person. People also avoided Ola May because she'd get upset over the smallest things. She had a sharp tongue, too. And when someone would upset her, she was quick to give them a piece of her mind and even cuss them out with a couple of strategically placed expletives or vulgar words. Few people wanted to challenge Ola May because she had a reputation for carrying a knife and a 22 caliber Glock pistol in her purse. She wasn't nothing to play with. In March of 2019, Shirley's company downsized and she connected with Ola May's employer and eventually moved to Ola May's hometown. And the first day Ola May saw Shirley on the job, Instead of going to her and introducing herself, Ola May made a beeline to a coworker and said, what you know about that woman? The person didn't have anything to share about Shirley. And so Ola May went to another coworker. And she went to about 15 coworkers before she gathered enough information that she figured to be adequate about Shirley that she could share with other people. But all of it was just hearsay and secondhand information. When Shirley inquired about a church at her job, someone told her to try St. Peter's Missionary Baptist Church. On the Sunday when Shirley decided to visit St. Peter's Missionary Baptist Church, Ola May saw and couldn't wait to tell other folk what she knew about Shirley. But most folk did what they normally do. They went the other direction because they knew Ola May's agenda, but she found a few folk <laughs> that would entertain her juicy gossip. The next week, when Ola May went to work, she had to leave early because she couldn't hardly stand up. Her legs kept getting weak. Every 30 minutes, she had to take a break. And the next day, she actually took off work to go see her family physician who recommended that she get some tests run. She went and got the test ran, and when the test results came back, she had a rare form of cancer that was inoperable. And when Ola May was hospitalized, the first and only person to visit her was Shirley Nance. When Shirley walked into Ola May's room, Ola May said, what you doing here? I don't need anybody coming to see me. Shirley said, even though I know that you've been talking about me and you haven't had good things to say about me, I wanted to check on you and see if there's anything that you needed. Ola May said, I'm good. And you can leave just like you came in. She said, matter of fact, you can let the dough knob hit you where well, the good Lord split you. Shirley said, I'm going to leave, but I promise you this, Ola May, I'm coming back, and I'm coming back to check on you, and I'm going to visit you as much as you will allow me. That visit from Shirley became the first of many consecutive visits and conversations that Shirley had with Ola May before she passed away six months after receiving unfavorable news from her physician. Before she died, Ola May asked Shirley if she would say some comforting words at her funeral. At Ola May's funeral, Shirley recounted some of the visits she had with Ola May 
And as Shirley recounted her last visit with Ola May, when she could still speak, there wasn't a dry eye in the congregation. Shirley said on that day, I asked Ola May, why is it that you've been living the way you've been living and acting the way you've been acting toward people? Ola May told Shirley, she said, I didn't know how to love and enjoy people because I had never experienced love from other people. She told Shirley, she said, I grew up in a home with a father and a mother who never showed me love. Shirley told the congregation that Ola May said, I was married to a man who never showed me love. And because I never knew love, I didn't know how to show love to my two children, my son and my daughter. And Shirley said that's the reason why her son and daughter is not here today because they don't know how to love to this day. Shirley paused, removed her glasses and dried her eyes. And said Ola May told me that I was the first person who had ever shown her love. And initially, she didn't know how to receive love because she had never experienced love. Shirley added these words. Ola May told me that my love for her was a radical and selfless love and that once she knew what it was like to experience that type of love, she wished she would have had more time to enjoy that kind of love and be able to share it with somebody else. She said, but Ola May told me, I know I don't have time because I'm going to die. But I look, Shirley, at all of the time I've spent not being able to truly give and receive love like I should have been. In my almost 25 years of pastoral ministry, I've, I've been around some folk like Ola May Turner. I've been around some people who grew up not knowing what it's like to experience radical and selfless love from a child of God who's displaying the character of God in loving somebody else radically and selflessly. I've been around people who didn't grow up knowing radical and selfless love because all they knew was abuse. I've, I've pastored people who did not know how to love because they experienced abuse from their parents, from their siblings, from co-workers, from strangers. All they ever known was abuse but not love. And because of them not knowing what love looks like, it's so hard for them to actually give out what they don't even know. I've been around people who grew up not knowing love and as an adult they still don't know how to love because they don't know what it looks like. How can you give somebody something that you don't even know about? I imagine I'm not the only one who's ever been around someone who's never experienced godly love that's radical and selfless. Some of you have been around someone like Ola May too. I want to take that for granted. How many of you ever been around somebody like Ola May? Seems like they, they don't know what love is. And the reason why they don't know what love is is because they've never experienced true love. Ola May and that type of lack of knowledge of God's love is the very reason why some folk go around treating people the way that they do and we stand back and wonder why is it that they act like they act, do what they do? It is because maybe they've never experienced the love that you grew up knowing. See, some of us have been around godly love for so long that we take it for granted that everybody knows that type of godly love. Some of you all have good, godly, loving homes, and you take it for granted that everybody has that type of home. But it's some folk who grow up in a hellacious home. It's a home where there's never any love shown. There's no compassion. There's no kindness. And if you were to talk to some people in here who work with children, they will tell you some of the darkest things that children 
have to say to them about growing up in a home where there's no godly love if you live in a godly home that's full of love compassion and kindness you better count your blessings if you have a loving husband a loving wife a loving child, a loving son, a loving daughter, a loving brother, a loving sister, a loving mother, a loving father. You better count your blessings because somebody don't know what that's like. Preach trouble. Don't take that for granted. But there is this radical love that our Lord and Savior Jesus talks about. It's the very reason for us developing this central idea, giving others radical love is not selfish, it's selfless. I want to lean into John chapter 13, these two verses, where Jesus says, new commandment I give unto you. I know Jesus said this is new, but really, the idea of loving others was not new. If loving others was really not new, why would he call it a new commandment? Because if you go back to Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18, God said, to this, said this to his people long before Jesus ever said these words. You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You catch it? You see what's making it a new commandment now? What makes it such a new commandment is when God gave it in the Old Testament, he said you ought to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Jesus comes back and he says you ought to love one another as I have loved you. See, it's different if you love somebody as you love yourself versus loving somebody as the Lord has loved you. See, the thing about loving somebody as you love yourself, the problem with that is there are some people who don't even love themselves. Did you hear that? Now I'm expecting someone to love me the way God wants them to love me, and they don't even love themselves. That's why it's new. Because Jesus comes and he says, uh-uh. Don't love the way you love yourself, your neighbor. Now I want you to love your neighbor, love another Chris, as I have loved you. That's what makes it new. Yeah, he changed it on us, but it's a good change. I want to keep leaning into this just a little bit because we need to look at the details as to what else he said behind this idea of a new commandment. First thing I want you to see is this radical love is people specific. If you look at verse 34, how is it that this love is people specific? Jesus said, love one another. Got a question, who is the one another? It's the one another, the saved and the unsaved? It's the one another, just missionary Baptist folk? It's the one another folk who are in my Masonic lodge? It's the one another, the people that's in my fraternity or my sorority. Who is this one another? The one another in this text are those of the Christian faith. It is another Christian brother or sister. Well, pastor, if that's the case, then we're excluding those who are not saved. You got to understand what Jesus is saying. This is the paradigm. This is where it ought to start. If there ought to be love anywhere in this world, it ought to be in God's family. And if you've got love in God's family, then that becomes a display of God's love to the rest of the world. And that's why it's such an indictment against the Christian church when we don't love one another. Because we stop showing the world God's love. I know the reason why some of us struggle with leaning into this idea of loving one another. Pride, selfishness, jealousy, envy, hate, rebellion, revenge. On the night that Jesus gave these words to his disciples, do you know what they were doing? 
John doesn't give it to us, but Luke does. Luke 22, 24 tells us what these guys were doing as Jesus is talking about love. You know what they were doing? They were arguing amongst themselves about who was going to be the greatest. And if that be the case, they were inward focus instead of being outward focused. Because if I'm thinking about who's going to be the greatest amongst us, then I'm inward focus. I'm thinking about Trevor. I'm not thinking about nobody else. And Jesus tries to refocus them. Stop looking and thinking about yourself and think about somebody else and love one another. Number two, let me move quickly. Don't be outward focus, be inward focus. This radical love is modeled after a perfect standard. If you look at verse 34, he says, I've already mentioned it, love one another as, here's the standard, as I have loved you. Remember he changed the standard. Not as you love yourself, but as I have loved you. Now, how high is this standard? Hmm? You can't get any higher than this because the Lord said it. It's a high standard. As I have loved you, that's how you are to love one another. Now, the question is, how did Jesus love us? See, that would be, that would be where I would go to. He demonstrated his love for us by what? By dying for us, but that's some chapters later. Is there anything in chapter 13 that shows us how Christ loves and is willing to love us? Is there anything in the, yes, there is. If you go back to the beginning of chapter 13 of John, Jesus modeled this radical, selfless, sacrificial love. In verse number one, John writes, chapter 13, now before the feast of Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come and he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He loved them qualitatively. He loved his own. But he also loved them quantitatively. He loved them to the end. The writer helps us to understand the love of Jesus and how it had no limits. And when someone needed to get up from the table, they're wearing sandals in that day. Feet are dusty and dirty. There's no servant to wash the feet of the disciples in Jesus Christ, but feet need to be washed. And when all of them guys just kept sitting there, somebody got up took a basin of water, took a towel and girded himself and made himself with servant humility. What they should have been doing, that's what he did. He got up from the table. Let me show y'all how to love somebody sacrificially and selflessly. If you, if you go back and you look at verse 1 and verse 3, it answers a question that I have. And the question that I have it's when all those guys kept sitting, what made Jesus get up from the table? If you look at verse 1 and verse 3, there are three things that I know why he got up from that table. He knew where he came from. He knew what he was sent here to do, his divine assignment. But then he also knew this, thirdly, he knew where he was going. What that says to me is Jesus knew his identity. He knew who he was. And the thing that keeps some folk from loving others is they don't know who they are. If you know that you are a child of God, if you know that you come from God, you've been born of God, and you know why God has called you and sent you, and you know where you're going ultimately to be with the Lord, who is the epitome of love, then you know how. To show love to other folk. In the pastor's corner for this month, you'll find these words in there. We should love everybody that God gives us to love. Because you cannot love someone 
that God does not give you to love. But if God gives you someone to love, you have to love that person. Now, I didn't write this, but the Lord always keeps talking to me, even as I'm coming to the pulpit. And one of the things that I don't have on this paper that the Lord want me to say is this. This type of selfless love, you're willing to be a servant and walk in humility, does not give people the room to treat you as a doormat. You, 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 you're nothing for folk to just walk over because you're willing to love them the way the Lord wants you to love them. Jesus was nobody's doormat. When he saw something that was wrong, he called it out. When they were in his father's house changing money out, he went in his father's house and he said to them, y'all made my daddy's house a den of thieves. Get out of here. That's, that's nobody's doormat. But he loved folk with a selfless love that took him all the way to Calvary, somebody said a minute ago, and caused him to die for our sins. But he's nobody's doormat. You're willing to love folk the way that Jesus said, as I've loved you. That don't mean that folk can mistreat you. And you just got to keep taking that for the rest of your life. Amen. See, there would be maybe some husband or wife or a wife being abused by her husband. And somebody walks up to her and says, well, you got to love your husband as, as Christ loved you. Yeah. But do that mean she got to keep getting knocked upside the head? Huh? Be careful how you take these words in scripture and apply them to your life. Thirdly, I'm done. Radical love also makes a powerful statement. Share this with you. I'm done. Verse 35. Here it is. Jesus said, by this, all men will know you are my disciples. What's the condition? If you love when Jesus was here, he revealed the Father to us. John chapter 1, verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. Only the begotten Son was in the bosom of the Father. He has explained him. He has declared him. He has revealed him. The Greek word, therefore, explain means to exegete. It means to know. It means to open up. It means to reveal. Christ revealed God to us. And since Christ revealed the Father to us, guess what our responsibility is? It is to reveal the Son to those who are around us. And we can display Christ's character by loving one another as Christ has loved us. Jesus said that there's something that we can do to let others know that we are truly his disciples. Is it the suit that I wear? Is it that black Bible that I mentioned? Is it how high I shout on Sunday morning or how loud I say thank you, Jesus? Is it the number of Sundays that I attend church that actually makes me a disciple of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? What is it that lets other folks know that I'm truly a child of the living God? It is when I'm able to love you as Christ has loved me. I don't want you to skip over or overlook how powerful this love truly is. If you truly love people with this type of love, it becomes a powerful display. When you choose love over hate, you choose love over envy, love over pride, love over selfishness, love over mistreatment, you are displaying the character of Christ. Guess what happens when you do that? That becomes an evangelistic tool that God uses to draw people to you. When you hate, it pushes people away. Mistreat, that pushes people away. But when you're able to love like Christ loved you, draws people, that's the type of church that we ought to have. One of my favorite illustrations Tell it, I'm done. My favorite illustrations about that type of love is that little boy who attended Sunday school at his neighborhood church. 
And when his family decided to move to another part of the city, that little boy kept walking back to that same church for Sunday school. Even though it meant walking a long way, even though it meant a tiresome walk, even though it meant his feet might start hurt, hurting from walking so far, he kept going. And a friend of his noticed it one day. And his friend said to him, why do you walk so far? He said, there are plenty of the churches in your neighborhood that you could go to that are near your home. And the little boy said, they may be good for other folk, but they're not for me. His friends say, why are those churches not for you? He said, because the church that I keep walking a long way to get to, they love a fellow over there. And that's the type of church that I want to be a part of. That folk will come miles away to be a part of because over there at Trinity, they love a fellow over there. That's a great evangelistic testimony that all of us can have if we're willing to love as Christ has loved us. Here's, here's a disclaimer. Does that mean that we won't ever disagree? If I love you the way Christ has loved me. No, it don't mean we won't have no disagreement. The way that I know that I'm loving you as Christ has loved me, you can have a disagreement. We can have those, and guess what? We still love one another. The doors of the church are open. You can come by letter, baptism, or Christian experience. But the church needs to display this radical, selfless love because there are people in this world who need this love. Go back to the beginning of the message to people who don't know this kind of love. Never experienced it, but they need it. Amen. They need it. How many of you are willing to show that love to someone today? Hmm? How many of you are willing to display the character of Christ? Show someone the true character of Christ. Help them to be introduced to Christ by how you love one another. Won't cost you any money to do that, but it may cost you some sacrifice. The doors of the church are open. You come by letter, baptism, Christian experience. The opportunity for you to come is now.